Hello, Bob. Yes, Ben. Glad to be back. This is our 24th hour together. Great. Uh, and um, we've often talked about filling his wake on this show, and it occurred to me just now that we do approach Finnegan's Wake very differently. I mean, it's a relief to talk to someone who thinks that Finnegan's Wake is relevant to understanding anything and everything in the modern world, however whizzy and uh, new it is. But what I wanted to explore was the difference in our approaches to it, because I saw Finnegan's Wake... I was alerted to it by my older brother, who... Growing up as the youngest in my family, I was a bit of a smart aleck, and my older brothers found me a bit intimidating because I was so quick to pick up on all the stuff they're talking about and echoing it back and being bright. And my older brother joked to my mother, oh yeah, he Ben's read all of James Joyce. And I immediately said to my mother, well, who's this James Joyce? Because I could see it was some sort of bone of contention whether or not you read James Joyce. And he's, she looked very disapproving and said, oh, a very difficult uh, writer, uh, you know, never mind about that. So I immediately thought Joyce sounded interesting and forbidden. So I went to the school library and found Joyce, and there was a big thick book called Finnegan's Wake, and the first one I pulled out was the thickest one, Finnegan's Wake. I pulled it out, and I found it wasn't written in English. It was written in comp smashed up words that reminded me of, of Jabberwocky by Lewis Carroll, which was my favourite poem. And I immediately thought, this book is absolutely fantastic, and I borrowed it, and I started reading out sentences to everybody I met. And I remember one classical scholar saying very early on there's some um, coax 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 which is from uh, the frogs by aristophanes and i had absolutely no idea it was a classical reference but it, they were very contemptuous and said oh everybody uses that passage from aristophanes it's so such a cliche and i just thought coax 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 written across the page was really amazing and exciting in a book so i had an immediate response to it i liked it uh, i it didn't worry me that that one couldn't take away a meaning and, and know what it was. It was just the the fact that it immersed you in this sea of languages and jokes and, and liveliness just, just seemed great. Whereas you, I believe, approach Finnegan's Wake more from what Marshall McLuhan said about it, and I find when you quote from it, you quote sentences of coherent explanation about the modern world a modern world that's only arrived after Joyce's time, which I find quite astonishing, and I, I really like it, uh, to have Finnegan's Wake explained in this more theoretical way. But I was just wondering about um, whether ever the idea of immersing yourself in its language, kind of getting drunk on its language, has ever appealed to you, or you've always approached it in this rather more analytical way, like using it as a guide to modern media. Okay, how old were you when you uh, encountered the wake? You were you in high school? Uh, yeah, I, I was about 13. Yeah, that's very early. For then, maybe now people would notice it more. You know, the kids can find out all kinds of things faster, but that's um, that's pretty uh, precocious to start looking and reading it. Well, I told you why I was being precocious. I mean, it was kind of, my family was kind of, even by uh, trying to discourage me, they were leading me towards it because I could see that James Joyce was this big cultural question that you could either master or not, and there was a big issue, you know, and my brother was frightened of it, so obviously I wanted to get it. But my surprise was that I found it so immediately attractive. I didn't find it off-putting, and, and I was having, I wasn't a particularly bright at school. I was having terrible problems with Latin. I, would, I learned Latin for eight years and never got anywhere with it, with frightening teachers and talk about grammar and you know th there were plenty of subjects which were intimidating me but i think i could smell in finnegan's wakes an end to intimidation now if you were 13 that's 1968 yeah very interesting um so i as a young man when i was 1935 13 i met joyce but i'm not going to go into that through my father in paris uh my father knew all these people and there were a reason why he uh, looked for them. So yeah, well, do go into I, that. It's an interesting story. People might feel a little bit disappointed if you're not going to go into that. Well, I could go to um, my uh, website and read you the diary entries. Okay, well, if it's there, it's there. Yeah, okay. People yeah, can you, find that. Go to fivebody.com and uh, look up um, what's called the Android meme Xenocrony Diaries, and be, the very first entry from April 22nd, 1935, is my encounter with Joyce through mm. my father. Mm. But my father, what was interesting is my father uh, was part of a group that read Finnegan's Wake when it was in transition 
in the 20s and 30s. This is before but, it was published as Finnegan's Wake, when it used to be known yeah. as a work in progress. Yeah, so he was part, this is, he was a, a butler for a very wealthy family in, in Paris, oh. and he met with these people, uh, which were, they were interesting people themselves. Uh, you could say they were intelligence agents, and they were interested in what Joyce, because what Joyce, Joyce had gotten attention with Ulysses, and now he was writing Garble. What the mm. hell happened to him? He mm. was starting in 1924, 25, 26 when he started publishing excerpts, mm. and eventually mainly in Transition magazine. Well, they I mean, it was published in 1939, so it's uh, just before the outbreak of the Second World War, and he was investigated by the British Secret Service in case it was a code book for the Germans to use, wasn't he? Yes, Did yeah. Did you know about that? I mean, he was oh, cleared. Yeah. They found that it wasn't a code book for the Germans, so it wasn't banned. No, basically he had so many censorship problems with Finnegan's, with Ulysses that on one level you could say he wrote the wake that way so that nobody could see what he was doing and couldn't, he couldn't get nailed for it. Mm, you know, that's mm. a, a one level to look at. So, so they would, uh, so my father would come home from these sessions and uh, I was just 10, say, and um, I always knew he had a session with these people because for about the next 24 hours he'd call me Tim Finnegan. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I didn't know what he was talking about, but I knew he was kind of drunk on it. You know, yeah. they were just, and yeah. the reason they were looking at it is that these intelligence agents on their desk were reports from all over the world in different languages. Hmm. And then here's Finnegan's a, a writing called Work in Progress, collaging languages from different cultures on each page. That was a direct mirror of the experience of these intelligence people. Oh, so they were wonder, wondering why yeah. Joyce was doing this. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I in my own background, I have um, an element of this because my father was brought up bilingually in Brazil, talking English and Portuguese. He learnt Welsh at a very young age, got interested in obscure and difficult languages, and ended up mastering um, hundred, uh, tens of languages. He ended up um, in Chinese scholarship as kind of the most difficult language you can think of to master, and Japanese and Russian and Sanskrit and Pali. And he loved mastering languages. And he worked for British intelligence during the war, um, um, trying to break uh, codes. He was in India uh, of the Japanese the Japanese were using, and he was the guy who knew Japanese to help with decoding. And um, but I, I, he didn't like, he didn't respond to Finnegan's Wake at all. And my enthusiasm with Finnegan's Wake, he found very disturbing because he was very into the correctness of an interpretation of mastering a language. And suddenly I was having an enthusiasm with something that was obviously using all the words and languages in the world, but from a poetic or a loose point of view that, that he, the, where was the correctness? He, he couldn't find it. So it's interesting that you're talking with intelligence agents that could see the point of something like Finnegan's Wake, whereas my father couldn't, and part of my Oedipal Rebellion was to hang on to Finnegan's Wake. Yeah, because these people uh, worked were international intelligence agencies, uh, not national. He's a nationalist. He's being an efficient bureaucrat helping uh, Britain against the Nazis or yeah, Japanese or something. Yeah, that's right. You know what I mean? yeah, yeah. The, the, the guys that my father worked with were the ones who caused World War I and World War II, the ones who profited from it. They were on a totally different level. You know what I mean? Uh -huh, but, uh -huh. but it was like, hey, here's this famous author. He's got a new book out. What is it? You go look at the book, and it's a picture of you. This mm -hmm. is how these guys, this, this guy is showing our experience. Why is he doing this? Is he, has he infiltrated us? You know what I mean? They're showing a picture of my desk. It was that shocking to him. Mm -hmm. It's like if, if Zappa put an album out and I run to the store and there's a picture of me on the cover, I would be shocked, right? Mm -hmm. If I had no connection with Zappa. It was like that. So I, so I knew of Joyce as a person that my father was involved in. Didn't know, wasn't interested in anything. But in uh, when I had to... Uh, uh, spy on McLuhan in 54, 55, eventually he would uh, talk about Joyce. Mm. And what I remember him telling me... Hang on, Bob, I want to ask you a vulgar question that I can't stand it when people ask me this vulgar question because of meeting Frank Zappa. People always say to me, well, come on, tell us what was he like? And I kind of cringe and say, well, I've written about meeting him and I've done all I can and I can't give you a little extra fame thing. But I do want to ask you, uh, what was Joyce like to you as a 10-year-old? Uh, I met James Joyce, Ezra Pound at different times, and um, uh, T.S. Eliot, Aleister Crowley, uh, who else in there, Yeats, uh, Aldous Huxley, all these people my father uh, oh. sort of Was Joyce out. blind every, by then? Every one of them. 
every one of them, and, I, and you can read in my diaries, triggered a psychic effect in me. I saw an image. I can't remember what I saw with Joyce. What? I think I saw... Here's what I saw. Did Brancusi saw... get close? Do you know the Brancusi drawing of Joyce? It's on the cover of Richard Elman's... One of the paperback of Richard Elman's biography, and it's like two, three vertical lines and a spiral. And from the photographs, I think it really gets Joyce's long face and the round glasses. Do you know that? By Brancusi, the Romanian abstract sculptor and artist? Yes, and actually that is a, that's appropriate because well, I remember looking at Joyce. I'm just a kid, but I got a psychic whack, whammy from it. Like there was something so powerful coming off these people or different that it triggered my psychic gland. And so I hallucinated or saw an image of, um, of something when I met these people. With Joyce, I saw this word banook, B-A-N-O-O-K, and I didn't know what it was. And years later, I decided, well, maybe it means ban the book. Mm -hmm. But then when I was in Nova Scotia, in Canada, there was a uh, paddling club called Banook. Ah. B-A-N-O-O-K. So it was about paddling. What I had seen, but it's, he had triggered it. But so I didn't know what it was. So he's saying, go paddle in the waters of life. Maybe. Maybe <laughs> that. It, it, I think it's just that they were so, um, they emanated some kind of power or charisma or uniqueness that my young mind would spiral off it uh, mm. and that image you're saying of the coverage that's what it was he was like it's almost like i don't remember him as a person he was an effect these mm. people were effects mm. on me mm. um so so us and what was he like um, i don't know i never uh, the last time i saw joyce was in 1939 and and i was 17 and i was still but, a kid so uh, i don't i don't know what they were like yeah, but, but I, i'll tell you this he though, was blind by then phone. was he blind do you remember him being blind mm, i remember him being odd yeah. yeah i mean he had the eye patch on and that i probably assumed he was but it was non-physical it was it was a psychic interaction mm. and and uh one thing if you, people might want to know what mcclough was like mcclough was a jerk very irritating to be around uh, at least when you first encountered him so if people want to know what he was like for me but anyways here's what happened is it very early in the fifth in the mid 50s when i started talking to McLuhan and i was pretending to be interested in his work and i was for other reasons but not on the aesthetic stuff and i knew nothing about america i just come here came from paris i didn't know r b or anything and uh he told me that finnegan's wake was a radio program not a book so you have to realize it's the first instance, uh, really, that I heard the idea consciously. Joyce said something similar in 1939 to me, uh, and you can read the diary entry, and that's, that's a diary entry based on a memory like 10 years later. I didn't write it down when I was 17, but then I remembered it as close as I can in the 4950, 1950, writing it down. Uh, so he said something like that but McClellan was the first where i told well, him i mean so the here, thing that joyce said that sounds like if i could just footnote that for for listeners that sounds like that to me is he said he couldn't understand people having difficulties with finnegan's way he said just read it out loud okay that's that's not what joyce said to me but what McClellan said was similar uh he said that finnegan's wake was not a book it was a radio program now uh -huh. i had no clue what that meant uh -huh. and i never pursued it at all i was aware of the wake but in my life i was running around as a harassed bureaucrat in the uh, intelligence world and and uh, i wasn't concerned about uh, aesthetics or anything but in 1968 same year as you war and peace in the global village came out and i was tracking mcclellan's books and in that book he has it's riddled with quotes from fitting his wake in the margins that's the first time I started actually reading quotes of Finnegan's Wake. Oh, I see. It, and so it's quotes chosen by uh, McLuhan that are directly about what you're thinking about. So you're taking yeah. it as as analytical concepts coming from Finnegan's Wake. Right. He, w he would put in the margins a quote to illustrate what he was saying in the center column of his prose. Mm. Mm. You know what I mean? So yeah. it was marginalia illustrate. So... And then he has the Ten Thunders of Finnegan's Wake outlined in that book. So I enter Finnegan's Wake uh, through technology or through McLuhan's model. Okay, I don't, I'm not doing it verbally. So by 1975, I uh, decided to actually read the book rather than thinking about it. Mm -hmm. and thinking about how McLuhan talked about it and the few quotes that I knew. So I read the whole thing through. And you know, it was, so it was if it's nineteen seventy five, are you listening? Are you reading Finnegan's Wake while listening to One Size Fits All by Frank Zappa? 
Yes, yes, I'm listening to Zappa. I'm with Zappa. I'm listening to Beefheart, listening to Bonzo Dog, Buddha Band, whatever they're called, Fire Sun Theater, all kinds of things. But the, the thing was, is I read through it, and I remember reading through it and noticing things, but at the end, I didn't know what I'd read. It didn't mean anything to me. So uh, then um, I got Eric McLuhan's thesis in 1983, his PhD thesis, and that emphasized the Ten Thunders. So that again sort of showed me how to approach it um, uh, through the technology model of McLuhan, which is not the aesthetic appreciation of the letting it wash over and enjoying the verbality of it. Mm. But, then, but then in 1985 to 1987, Roland McHugh's annotations came out so I could look at meanings. All right, he had the top three interpretations of the critics of each line. You know that book, uh -huh. Roland McHugh's annotations. So I would read a page a day and read every word and look at the meanings and think about what McLuhan said about it and actually get into the music of it. Uh -huh. and, th and then when I was in New York City, I went through the whole book for a couple of years in the 80s. And then in New York, I was a member of the Finney's Wake Society of New York, and we went through every every uh, line and we went through like I was there for nine, 93 to 2000 so for for seven years I'm doing the wake in depth with people who are enjoying the music of it so in that way I got through the verbal stuff but mm. every time when I left the group or when I walked home or thought about it later I always thought well what's the point of this and I thought about how McLuhan said he was applying Joyce so for me I found the technological model was the best way to tell people about it who normally would hear from the regular Joes who read Finney's Wake, who'd say, well, it's great verbal fun and play. To me, that was uh, too that, limiting. That Maybe sells it short. To intrigue people. That sells it short, and, and that's kind of those the thoughts that are coming up in my mind, were that I don't quite want to say, well, it's a verbal bath, I want you to paddle in it and uh, slosh around in it in a vague sort of way, because I think the enjoyment you get from the wake or what it does to you is slightly more precise than that and probably because i don't believe that responding to music is in fact a laying back and letting something wash over you in fact that response to music which is david toop's ocean of sound book the idea you lie on your sofa this kind of decadent wagnerian you know you're sniffing perfumes and this music wafts over you is actually the opposite of the excitement that i get from music which is an idea of relief when something's correct which all the things which are incorrect or have been worrying you about music flake off and so for me the idea of choosing which music you like as against all the music which doesn't move you and seems to be constructed wrongly is crucial and therefore when you're responding to the to what Finnegan's Wake does to you I don't think it's simply washing over you it's also washing off a lot of what you haven't been enjoying about reading books which is their inability to express what it's like to actually read a book and at random i have a sentence in front of me and it says we want bud we want bud bodily we want bud bodily bodily and that for me is finnegan's wake that it voices the experience of my whole body in sitting down to read a book and doesn't just speak at a level of um, concepts which are, are clicking into some preconceived conceptual pattern I have in my head which a lot of uh, books in fact do they, they trigger whether we're talking about a very simple romance design for female readers which just goes click click about uh, fantasies about handsome doctors or, or whatever the the, the the genre of romance is or in fact uh, books which are considered very difficult philosophy which in fact repeat back to people the philosophical jargon they've already mastered and merely go round again that fitting his wake is continually because of its and this is my argument about music that that one's response to music is uh, a it's something subconceptual. It's not your mind, it's your body responding to the music. But to be able to recognize that your body twanging to it is akin to a psychoanalysis or an understanding of where your body is, which is removing a repression which is normally there. And therefore, it's a delicate operation and a very specific operation. And what you just said again is stating what I felt. The, the washing over in the music sense of Finney's Wake, I always thought that wasn't the point. 
that was mm. a subset and a relaxation point. Mm. But it, that's why I I liked our fittings weight group because we would analyze every word and figure out the puns and all that. And that it it, it stopped fittings weight stopped you just having a normal prose experience. And because of McLuhan, I knew that it was communicating the whole body. And then I would add, though, the extensions of the body, the media. So your way of describing the wake is what I was always trying to advocate. And my way of doing it was to get them out of the musical cliche response mm. and to point a whole other level of looking at it. Mm. And so I had the same motive as you did. Mm. But I turn it around and say... Um, that cliched musical response is selling music itself short because I don't think music is something that washes over you that Beethoven is writing something very specific and for a purpose to to alert you to to society and your body and your relationship to the cosmos um, which is not um, it may get turned into just pretty music which washes over you but that's not the intent of any important music no, exactly, and that's what I meant. I'm referring to, you know when you read the average populist presentation of the wake, they say, just enjoy the music of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just babble away. Mm -hmm. And that's how I read it in 1975. I just was reading through, I didn't know what it was, I had no annotations or anything. I wasn't going to be running looking up every word, so I just sort of went through and, and just noticed whatever glimpse at me. Um, that I knew was not appropriate. And so uh, I used McLuhan to get people not to, to assume that cliche. In, in the Phoenix Wake group, there was always new people coming, and they'd always be befuddled by it, and they'd always say, well, I'm just going to let it wash over me. And then I'd jump in and say, no, 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 that's not the way to do it. Mm. And, and I'd irritate most people because they thought, well, yeah, that's what we're doing. We're letting it wash over mm. us. That is um, exact. That's why Joyce said the eyes demand their turn, let them be seen. He wanted you to see music. Mm. And this is the see consciousness it. that, for me, uh, the great music that I think is pertinent to our times and this is why I think music criticism is a very political act and creates a lot of conflict around where music criticism is published and what's allowed to be said that it isn't simply a matter of these people like this and those people like that and they should be serviced I think there's very little music at one time which is really important and is doing something that matters and that music I think in its very detail is talking about everything all the time that every note choice that's happening in this pertinent music i'm talking about is exploding error and making points about different areas of life and um, um, expressing anger and uh, joy at all kinds of very specific moments of the life that we're all in and it's that truth which which worries people and is often considered to be the the noisy horribleness of modern music whereas in fact it's it's pertinence to you and that there's a relationship between this is why it doesn't can't just wash over you because every grain of it has in it a picture of something which is communicating a position and a um, a determinate angle on things that's exactly what the wake does so when when um, there were so many arts that were attempting that in the 100 years ago, pointing out what you're doing, and uh, so I didn't want people to turn Fittings Wake into a fetish and stay there, but it was the most comprehensive thing to make the point you just made in so many different ways you could use the wake. So I applied the wake to point out what was happening now and I did not want to fetishize the wake. So the wake was... By fetishize was, you mean sort of become just a Phineas Wake scholar or yeah. somebody who just told everybody they got to read this great work of literature which actually does it a disservice because then great literature becomes bigger than Finnegan's Wake and it becomes merely an illustration of the idea of great literature and you're not really taking the book seriously whereas to apply it, to take it out of simply reading Finnegan's Wake to claiming that it's an analysis of media as you do is really to read the book. Yes, and I think that's what... Uh, uh, I think people can understand that Joyce was satirizing those that wanted to make a big deal out of the book. So they don't even get, as we encountered in London last April, or a year and a half, a year ago, April, um, that group fetishizing every little thing and missing the point. Mm -hmm. Missing at least one of the agendas of, of Finnegan's Wake. I think he includes all the agendas, 
including the scholarship, but he definitely makes fun of scholarship or turning the book into uh, something that he was critiquing that tendency all the time. So, mm. you, I talk of, I, I Which is I why, I mean, like Frank Zappa's music, I find that the person who knows nothing about it, you read out a sentence to them and you find out more than if you go and ask an expert. And then I fall just by random, I've got it open here, we are once or more as babes are wandering in a world made fresh, where with the hen and the story of boot, we start from scratch. Yeah, the, so we're babes in the wood. It's trying to get at that infantile experience of wonder of what things are that, in which you actually experience and actually look at stuff rather than already knowing what it is and, and um, fitting it into your preconceived patterns. Right. The Phineas Wake Society people thought it was absurd that I would be on New York radio or TV talking about Phineas Wake with people who never heard of it, mm. never even knew what it was. They, they thought you had to read the book and understand it. And I was given the clue to, in other words, I was presenting it to people who didn't know anything about it, mm. like you're presenting Zappa. This That's reminds me of a, a, a debate I've had in email this week with a writer for The Wire called Sam Davies, who I criticized in a uh, an article I wrote for a book on noise called Noise and Capitalism put together by an editor called Matin and I criticised him for changing his mind about a band called Ascension who I reckon are doing when I was talking about the detail being um, critical and um, um, mattering I was thinking of Stefan Yevortsin's guitar playing in, in, in the band Ascension and Sam Davies um Ah, I've lost. Get back to what you were saying, Bob. Uh, saying I was, I would bring up Finning his wake to people like you did. Who yeah, yeah, and so. and yeah, that's got me back on the track. Thank you. That Sam Davis was saying. I have um, studied modern music. I have um, uh, uh, now got to a stage where I can understand Ascension's music because I've gone and uh, listened to Pierre Boulez and and to Cecil Taylor, and I've mastered it. And I just felt this is so wrong that modern music is not something that you um you accrete like a positive uh culture which you own it's actually a shedding of culture so that you can get to something direct um it's learning how to rid yourself uh that may be a discipline and it may be um uh, you're helped by uh, other people who've done music and so on i'm not saying you, you you don't use anything but i'm saying that this idea of accumulating a positive sort of um uh, culture which then allows you to appreciate these high works is based upon the the old way of doing culture it's pre-modernist this is the um classical view of the accumulation of knowledge and it's not appropriate for responding to things like ascension or or, or to um sorry that was my microphone falling off uh, this apparatus i have i have a chopstick attached with a piece of masking tape on top of my computer and it just fell down obviously it responded to my great idea of great unmediation response to your complaint. Uh, yeah yeah but uh, do you feel that about um uh, how we should respond to modern media and and the kind of interventions that are exciting in it that, that we agree with that that it's against this idea of building up slowly a culture which we master and it's actually seeking to to shatter that so that we can get to some a more uh, direct communication with other people. Yeah, the what you were describing is the literate Encyclopedia Britannica effect of the printing press phase. That's the classical yeah. mode. You, you are and, and the boringness of people who claim to be uh, music writers, of experts, of, you know, I mean, I just groan when I hear that someone's an expert on jazz. I always think, actually, this person doesn't understand jazz at all. You know, because the person who really understands jazz actually is, is is triggered by jazz to become their own creative vortex, that they become somebody who can look at things and therefore of relevance to them will be the, 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 the mad music that their uncle used to play on the organ when they were 10 years old. Now, if somebody starts talking to me about that, I know I'm talking to someone who really will tell me something about music. Whereas if I talk to someone who says they've mastered jazz, I know I'm talking to an idiot. Yeah, using McLuhan's framework, the literate person, the classical tradition, is that your receptacle, passive receptacle, accumulating conceptual categories and data and labels. Okay, whereas a tactile approach to music, you're describing a tactile approach, not an acoustic uh, expertise, but a tactile approach, where I don't know what I'm going to like today, 
And I wouldn't categorize what I liked uh, two months ago. I can turn on a cow seal song, and if I'm in a certain response, I'll like it. Mm. Next day, I won't mm. like it. I yeah. don't know what I'm going to like. And there is and a reason. But what is interesting. What I like yeah what is interesting there is a determinate reason why you like or dislike it i'm not arguing for a kind of relativistic nihilism in which we just throw up our hands and say oh well let's just get on with it and no one can understand why you like or dislike there are reasons why suddenly a window opens up in in different kinds of music at different times in your life or on different days or in different moments the, 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 which are very specific and that you can tell people and you can communicate i mean i'm i wouldn't like people to think that we're both getting on a thing of just getting rid of reflection and analysis but i think we need to confess a lot more our very personal ways in and ways round which would ma actually make writing rather more interesting if people revealed where they came from when they're talking instead of adopting a kind of dry expertise which uh, aims towards some kind of objectivity um, which isn't objective. Real objectivity yeah. has to state what position you're coming from. I mean, this is Einstein's point, isn't it? Yeah, it, I don't uh, judge my breathing. Uh, I don't judge my breathing. It, absorbing information, music, and that is like breathing. And I might start thinking about my breathing or meditating on it, but I'm not going to stay with any definite concepts. I've never learned anything from music. Uh, I've never accumulated any experience, but I know what I'm going to like. <laughs> and I have to cancel that statement. I don't know what I'm going to like, but yeah. I do know what I responded to. And I find that something I, I responded to a couple of years ago, I don't respond to now. Like Zappa, I come in and out of. But yeah. I always find in the long run, Zappa still, he always is powerful. But Bob, <laughs> I always enjoy on these programs saying the absolute opposite of what you've just said and then finding how you may or may not agree with it. And in a way, I think all I've ever learned from is music, that Finnegan's Wake I absorbed as music because I got on with the process of getting through it before... I stalled at understanding or not understanding the detail and the process of going through it becomes something which expresses a point of view which then allows you to look at the details but until you've got that you you can't speak about it and this immersion in a process and a moving attitude that the that the movement from one word to another and the pronunciation of it of learning that the sound of it has to be in your mind as you read it you don't have to read it out loud in order to understand it but unless you're aware of what the sound and the look all these different things that you can apply to the word are then you're not going to be able to grasp it so this thing of entering the process of it before you um, set up the, the the gates to 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 uh, uh, absorbing this idea is true or that that idea is untrue this having to dive into it into the river before you know that you have to get your feet wet you have to paddle right and McLuhan said that uh, Joyce and uh, the other greats communicate before the reader's understanding mm. so you're responding yeah. to what's communicated now here's what I meant by and then you need help then you need help from other people to explain why you like it so much I mean for me the pertinent art that I respond to I really like it and I'm convinced it's really important and then I'm floundering around to explain why and often I need to go to other people and talk about it in order to kind of recover myself and I want someone to tell me why I like it. I go out looking for explanations and that's the community that arises why uh, so often the pertinent art is like a filter for filtering out the the ninnies and the twits so that you don't need to communicate with them so you find the right people so that they can start to explain yourself to yourself. Right, now that's exactly what I was going to say a minute ago this way. Um, when I say I don't learn anything from music or anything that, ter that inspires me or does something to me, it frees me from my learning, mm -hmm. from my concepts. And mm -hmm. that's why you go around trying to naturally reconceptualize what you've been liberated from. Mm. Yeah, and it's that um, openness to, to, to what your, how your the parts of your being which are not conceptual are going to respond that listening to them which is why it's like psychoanalysis why it has this progressive um uh, criticism of the 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 repressive 
sociality that is based upon biting your tongue and sitting on your hands and not acting and being bored waiting for your chance to bore everybody else which is what most culture seems to consist of yeah so the categories of experience that the mind naturally creates great art liberates you from that not to put down the conceptualization that natural there's a natural time lag in mm. a person's consciousness yeah the, the what actually music does i learn nothing from it but then after the experience i start learning better or more the concepts Hmm. Well, it's and like then I go back to yeah. the music or to Zappa to unlearn what I did to fill in after the first uh, experience. Hmm. But this is where communication starts for me. That yeah. there is no real communication in the kind of um, squabbles between people who like different musics. We're not communicating. We're having battles. I mean, this is the reason why when I was younger and even now I don't like politics, where people have stuck positions and then they hurl shit at each other until somebody's piled the other person in more shit than the other. I mean, this is what I felt when I met um, Winter Masalis, for example. I was quite shocked. I was used to meeting musicians from jazz, people like Billy Bang and people that Lee's Jazz put on, and you'd meet them and and fundamentally you'd you'd simply have this companionship and we are both supporting this wonderful music that not many people have heard of and it's quite hard and there's not much money in it how are we going to you know improve the situation and you you'd talk to them and work with them on the, on that problem when i went into Marsalis, i met somebody from a completely different angle i met someone it was like talking to a politician he was out to prove me wrong he was out to <laughs> prove me a bourgeois you know and it was like uh, it reminded me of debates, um, political debates at school or something, you know, outwitting your opponent. And it was just uh, 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 shocking for me. But when I, I thought about it, I thought, well, this is not the area of um, of 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 culture that, 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 that matters, that you've got to have the experience yourself before you apply the concepts. And it's getting that in the wrong order, which seems to me to explain a lot of what's wrong with education, that it's... Um, the results of experience, the analysis, but without the experience, so that people have to take on trust that all this stuff is true, which is why it's very important for teachers to actually give experience to their students. Uh, just a, a small example, in Bradford there was a teacher who took some uh, of the art students and uh, they were teaching to a morgue and had them put their fingers in the vagina of a dead woman. And I thought that was a very intelligent teacher because that teacher was giving them an experience for then the reflection and, and so on. It wasn't simply a lurid stunt, it was designed to force them into something which they hadn't considered before so that they would all begin talking to each other and actually learning and uh, that that is is crucial without that everything is just dry as dust um, uh, oppression yeah you you often refer to uh, Mingus and people like him who didn't like the term jazz when Marsalis is running around within the android meme conditions of the 80s and 90s, hoiking up the concept of jazz and yeah. representing it. Yeah, well, he was completely part of the niche marketing commodification of music of the 1980s, and he was a, a spokesman riding that, much like uh, a yuppie entrepreneur riding the crest of um, dot com you know um investment or something you know talking up a storm for this particular area that we can provide a political justification for um and without any um real love of of what the music can do to people you know it was like right, a demonstration like all those other books on zappa i mean i have to say i do have some winter masalis albums there are moments when i quite enjoy it as a kind of very brittle uh show off shiny um, uh, reproduction of a certain style there's a certain charm in it and when he goes uses the blues there's a certain incongruity between his classicizing precision and the blues and there are certain aspects of his music which are, are fairly enjoyable um, but it's as a as a ideological spokesman uh, that that the whole thing comes crashing down um, I had a chance, I had a, well, two points. Um, I wanted to say that what you're describing, this commodification, like all those other books on Zappa, they're, uh, they're victims of that. And what's interesting about your book is that you showed your response to Zappa, which had nothing to do with Zappa, but it had all this uh, mastery of Western culture, sort of, in quotes. Mm. Uh, references that no, people say, well, that has nothing to do with Frank. Well, that's mm. not the point. This is Ben's response to Frank. Are you talking about the people who kind of are selling their 
privy information i mean i suppose the uh, barry miles book is the perfect example of that with someone who was claim i mean it claims on the, uh, the the back of the book that he was there for the session for hot rats although that's not something you can actually find in the book which for selling to an english audience is you know the way to sell it you know it's the most famous frank zappa record here was somebody who was there when it was recorded this must be the key to this puzzling oeuvre um, <laughs> and people selling their their insider tips you know that the, the, they've seen that and i i was forced because of my position to approach zappa as i i'm somebody in a different country the records are coming out i love them but uh, you know as to being part of the court circle I, I i'm obviously excluded you know i have to write in paranoic is isolation well you should you don't want to be a member of it those people like miles in the end write books that put down zappa and they barry miles hates zappa the whole thing is an assassination he, he does yeah. a, a moral critique all about he can't bear zappa's uh, openness about sex he thinks zappa's cynical and accuses him of procuring prostitutes for the band and um he's kind of disgusted with 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 frank and and can't yeah. really understand why the music works or or what makes you sit up and listen when you hear the records he has no response to the disjunctures in the music i mean if you don't like the the sudden changes and the the gaps that open up for you on a frank zappa record i mean what are you listening to it's just you know it's mad to, to write a book about him right and so when i had the chance uh to meet winton marsalis i did my music test on him i said what do you think of frank zappa and he said no i prefer yes did he because i know bramford his brother yeah, they all went to see it. they all went to see yes in um, new orleans and they loved it which for me was an absolute illustration of the fact that they can't hear music <laughs> that's right no hey when marcel said he never heard zappa's music he hardly knew of him right yeah so then i knew he was a man out of his time yeah he was yeah. in the past yeah he didn't even, not, not to be a musician today and not confront and deal with zappa mm. In a way, that's inexcusable, but yeah. people have the right to do it. And, and you can, and it's not like um, everyone in jazz is 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 in this position. I mean, Frank Kofsky, who wrote one of the best books on uh, on John Coltrane. Um, he interviewed Frank Zappa, you know, back in 69 for... 67. 67. interview with Zappa I read in Jazz and Pop. Exactly. You know, so uh, all these things unite. And this is what I discovered um, when I did work as a jazz journalist. To my surprise, I found that the always, when I talked to really good musicians, they were sophisticated about genre or they, they, they weren't stuck in genre and that they often um if i mentioned zappa would just say what you know amazingly interesting music they, they put it like that and they weren't bothered with all these um uh, categories which show that that music isn't for them and then i realized that's a consumer problem that's the the marketing divides people up into this is my identity and we've talked on these programs about how we are into the uh, non-identity politics that we find identities actually is um, a subscription to the marketing system which defines consumers and that and that and that leads into facebook but before i have one more story on what we're just saying immediately um gary giddens interviewed i remember this like 25 30 years ago i think it was gary giddens one of the village voice jazz critics interviewed went over to cecil taylor's uh, home and was looking at his record collection and was shocked that he had James Brown and all this stuff that wasn't jazz in yeah. his collection. <laughs> the critic, the expert, yeah, was yeah. shocked. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I once wrote a Facebook. Yeah, I wrote a poem about that once about um, Cecil Taylor listens to Marvin Gaye, but then I said, "But Mr. Gaye, do you check out Cecil, old Smoothie Chops?" <laughs> okay, yeah, that's Frank's question. Yeah, that is what Frank said meant when he said, "We, I have questions for the culture." Yes, he is. Mr. Gay, do you check out Cecil Taylor? Yeah. Usually they don't. Yeah. Well, it's uh, it's the interesting one, isn't it? <laughs> because they're, they're one sided. The the successful. Yeah. But this is very much we it. are talking over the oeuvre of Frank Zappa because we proceed from the point of view is that we can't stand people who don't check everything out and see whether they like it or not. We're not saying they have to like everything, are we? We we just want a response, but the one that isn't prejudiced by saying that area of culture is not for me. Um, yes, but but do you listen to Rush Limbaugh? Do you listen to <laughs> Rush Limbaugh? <laughs>
Well, what is Rush Limbaugh? I never heard of it. Play me <laughs> some. Don't know. Do you listen to Yanku Dumitrescu, Bob? <laughs> yes, yes, and, I, and you played me. Was that what you played me? That was what I was playing you earlier. Yeah, yeah. Yes, that for the first time. I, I, oh, that's why I listen to your Out to Lunch show, because I'm going to hear stuff that I haven't had time to find. Yeah, well, tell me, though, what, what this thing that you're referring to now is. Cause I, Rush Limbaugh is the famous founder of right wing talk radio. Oh, I see. Right. And so you're before, stretching music to mean absolutely everything. Yes, I'm yeah. talking about uh, experiencing and uh, looking into all kinds of things. Of course, that, one needs to check everything out. I would never say anything is evil or tainted or that if I touch it, it's going to turn me to stone. I mean, uh, I need well, to. Well, I bet you, you you're limited by the medium. You have not listened to my uh, other self that does uh, cash flow. You haven't mm. checked the other parts of me. Well, out. there are. I mean, I don't stop thinking because of this openness to what things are, and. Uh, I certainly, uh, I'm also uh, believe in uh, no platform for fascists, so I, I'm quite prepared to uh, pull the chair out from underneath people saying certain things which I think destroy uh, democratic discourse, and I'm not an absolute libertarian to the point of tolerating fascism, no. But that probably right. is an issue for discussion elsewhere, but yeah. Yeah, yeah, you actually turn this thing that you must listen to everything and explore everything into a political program, an agenda. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the idea of getting rid of agendas. No, but the, the idea of getting agendas and pretending to um, uh, be is, is liberalism, you know, and, and actually it's a, from a very comfortable and powerful and uh, in place politics. It's justifying what is and saying, well, I can check everything because nothing really matters. So uh, I'm not coming from that point of view. Yeah, and that's important to make that. And I never know what I like. Uh, I'm going to turn on and listen to something and I'll uh, be amazed. I like something that I definitely didn't like 20 years ago. So I do not know what I like. What's that famous line? People don't know about art, but they know what they like. Yeah, it's the it's the defense of philistinism and ignorance is saying, I don't know much about art, but I know what I like. And Theodore Adorno turned around and said, no, uh, you, you like what you know. Right, and I like. don't know what I know, and I don't know what I like, so yeah. I'm available to listen to anything. Well, I definitely I don't, don't know. like what I know. And, what I know is and miserable that, and needs to be changed. Can yeah. you say it again? You definitely will. I definitely don't like what I know already, and uh, it's uh, <laughs> partial <laughs> and like limited and know. patchy and needs to be completely changed by the transforming fire of the Bob and Ben revolution, of course. Yes, yeah, so let's go into Facebook, which mm. um, we were talking last week on how... Uh, uh, gamma was lost in Facebook and I wanted to explore that what is it about uh, Facebook uh, that Esther is complaining about Over well yourself. yeah maybe I should explain to listeners a bit that gamma is my total inspiration here in London he's my um, my Finnegan's wake of the soul I, I go and talk to him and he word surfs and he puts me makes me feel right and and for the last Five, six, five, for, for, for five or six no. years he's been my complete support I met him drinking on a park bench and I took bottles of wine and he can read my books without um, taking them uh, the wrong way he, 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 his line is he likes my language and I love it when he says that <laughs> and uh, I, I can make him recite my poetry and when he recites my poetry he answers his phone and just carries on reciting my ridiculous poetry to whoever phones him up so um, I adore Gamma, and he's been my great support. He used to phone me twice a week, and he'd always phone me after my radio show and comment on it and didn't always like it. Sometimes he'd criticise it, but not, you know, he's usually enthusiastic, and he'd go off at tangents and make me feel it was worth doing the radio programmes. And recently, no phone calls. And then I find from people who do Facebook, he's Facebooking, Gamma's Facebooking, he's relating everybody to everybody and everything to everything. So Gamma has a whole Facebook thing going on, so I hardly ever hear from him. I did get a call from him today, which uh, my partner Esther took, and then I rang him up, but then I interrupted him and doing something, and so it was a brief conversation. So I'm still in touch, but I, I've lost my friend Gamma to Facebook, which makes me think about Facebook, but what makes me not keen to dive into Facebook myself is reports from my partner who spies on Facebook, Facebook, Facebook without actually doing it, and she says that some of the wonderful people we know, and she was thinking of Marco Morizzi, the um, extraordinary zapologist and critical mind in, in Rome, everything's nicey-nicey, that Marco's Facebook is domestic, and it's, it's all chitter-chatter about how I went on a nice holiday for three days and I've been cooking minestrone lately, um, and it's all 
so benign and she's saying where's the edge where's the marker we adore who proves that george romero is the only filmmaker worth watching and unless you're making a zombie film you should die you know where's that marco gone and that is her experience her comment on on facebook that somehow it's it's networking has introduced an insidious lack of of debate and a, a lack of pride so that people are just like come into my facebook and look at these my pictures of my family everything's become showing pictures of your family to each other and we all share and where's and this is why i created a thing on our website called the artwork because i decided we've got to have things which are called artworks where we proudly say this is it folks this is my statement and you can hang it in your ass this 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 is what i'm saying and then people can come along and say no i completely disagree with this but that's where the argument gets heated and high and proud and interesting and if everybody's just being nice to each other i think the level of the culture just dribbles down to the lowest common polite boringness okay now without knowing anything about facebook that's my view on it so well, how what do you think of that well i see that you're irritated by it and i i was thinking uh this is a common theme of finning's wake he approaches every new technology and as hce reacting to them pro and con he has four views constantly going on so we have this facebook is this a big problem does this undermine the marxist agenda does it undermine the fascist agenda does it make people totally uh silly and useless uh, or is it just a passing thing there's mm. the very question. I don't mm. uh, how to look at this complaint from Ben. I don't do Facebook myself. Someone registered me somehow, and so um, there is a, a Bob Dobbs thing there, and people post on mm. it, but I hardly ever respond. But I do check out some that Gamma, who keeps sending me every day a new friend, and I'll I'll click on it, confirm their friend, and see who it is. But I won't spend much time there, and uh, so it's a strange thing where mm. I have. Linked in with a lot of Facebooks, but I don't engage it. Oh. And uh, so, so you're doing I'm all the linking. In this world, but not of this world. You're doing all the linking without doing the work. You know, you're yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. I'm just oh, yeah. you have to go over here now. Okay, I'll go over there. Yeah. I'll get along. Yeah. But but I'm faking it. I'm, yeah. I'm not involved. Yeah. Uh, so is but it's interesting. Here's a new technology. It's a big deal. A lot of people do it. They now do Twitter. Do you know what that is? Yeah, I'm, um, I was talking to Sean Bonney, the poet, and he's enthusiastically Facebooking and produced some guy he went to school with at a concert I went to yesterday, found through Facebook. But he says Twitter's beyond him. He's tried it, and it's just the comments that you put in have to be so short he can't he can't get round it. <laughs> yeah, because a lot of people like the shortness, and then oh. they get quit quick comments mm. from people but people say oh, okay i just got out of the bathroom uh, i'm gonna have some chipmunks now and then they uh, an hour later report something else i mean can you imagine what silly state of mind you have to be in to report what you're doing to nobody because who's reading you maybe one friend mm. it is an example of living in nowhere land yeah well uh, this this facebook yeah. but isn't this the thing that we have to fight i mean which you fight by walking down the beach and uh, looking at the or swimming and, and looking at looking and mentioning to the beach bum there have you read four chapter four of Penning and <laughs> <laughs> yeah but also <laughs> one of the, the, the speaking spanish or something. the points that you make you bring up one of your McLuhan-esque bodies that you're in that, that yeah, yeah, a lot yeah, of our yeah. alienation is not being able to actually enjoy the life we're living because it's not represented by something and um a feeling of um that you're sitting in a beautiful park but what's the point because it's just you and you're not on your mobile telling somebody i'm sitting in a beautiful park <laughs> until you and in effect what that is until you've paid somebody because the reason why bt british telecom coined the slogan it's good to talk isn't because they think it's good to talk at all it's because they think it's very good to pay to talk you're paying somebody to talk and what interests me about the discussion we're having now on skype is we're not paying to talk because it's a free service it's a free service. Long and, live Skype. And I'm, so, a, I mean, I'm so aware that it's selling uh, telephone stuff, but that doesn't affect me because I don't have a mobile phone. But uh, the 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 but business of uh, uh, but it's I a, go onto the beach every day. Yeah. And what's interesting, it is is a subset. People are reading books, at least in the summer. Mm. Everybody, all the beauties are on there bathing in the in this amazing beach, and they're all reading. And I have to hold myself back 
from walking around. I'm seething ball of frustration as I before I get in the water, where I want to knock the book, the stupid bestseller on the head, and say, "Look at this radio program," and hand him fitting its weight. Yeah. Okay? So I, I'm doing the yeah. work. I'm there controlling myself, but what? I'm thinking and seething and yeah. eating, and. Uh, that is, uh, that's me responding to yeah. the present. I, I'm still trying to, hey, let's check you out. Can you really read? Look at this. <laughs> yeah. Have you done that to people? Well, Have you, can you read that page? Page yeah. three of Fitting Away? And yeah, they start yeah. to read it, they, they collapse. Yeah. They fail. They, I say, see, you can't read. <laughs> full of stains, full of medals, full of blick black blobs, gross arctic, <laughs> total avens, some garment guy, insects appalling, low hum clang, sin, a cheap decoy, too deep destroy, say manga graphic, may say nay, poor daguerre. Photography. And, and then, if they all were reading Finning's Wake when I went down there next time, I would shove the, shove the art of being ruled in their face immediately. I would yeah. switch to Lewis allegiance. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, but the the reason I brought up the the beach was this um, realizing it, that it's taken a certain amount of maturity and maybe um, uh, or it's been a battle in my life about getting rid of my super what Freud would call the super ego or the uh, sense of what is um, cultural as being real the inversion of life culture as life I mean this is a situationist argument that that. The idea that only when you're talking on the mobile phone or that you're communicating via Facebook or on the computer that you are real and that when you are um, not communicating via any of those means but you're sitting um, and staring out the window that that is um, a miserable nothingness whereas I think that's an inversion and that I agree with Adorno who talked about wanting to lie in the water doing nothing like a beast and when I look at animals in the zoo who are doing nothing and they're not bored because they're being the animal for me there's something wrong with our species being and our way of communicating that that, that we're pressurized into thinking that that's not life whereas that in fact is the life that we have that isn't very long and we're not going to have it forever and that's the point that is the amazing thing we don't swear on this so i can't quote the zappa quote but it's effing great to be alive and reaching that point where you realize that real life is the point not all these representations of it which is what the money system doesn't want you to have because it doesn't make money money is a representation so being obsessed with money all the time is being obsessed with a representation and realizing representations are representations of something which is real which is your life which is has a terminus and we need to live it is to me the revolutionary idea that I want to communicate to people. And we only have a minute or so left? Yeah. What do we have? In fact, we're two minutes overdue. All right, well, <laughs> so I want to just say this then end. Yeah. Con conventionally, all Facebook dupes must deal with such separable problems as the correlation of the final creation to reality, the authenticity of the creative experience, and the manipulation of human reactions, and concentrate throughout the artistic process on formal unification, while also focusing on the possibility of introducing what in historical context will somehow contain novelty. Whether reality is rendered through imitation or is introduced anew, if it is to be measured for its viability, art is reduced to a dry empiricist epistemology, and so is Facebook. And who said that? You. I'm quoting uh, Richard Meltzer, The Aesthetics of Rock. Okay, we'll end with Meltzer. Thanks, Bob. Bye. Bye.